a prolific writer. He's written over 20 books of nonfiction and fiction. Um, I think that the book that is my personal favorite is one that was on Larry's Goldfarb, Goldfarb, Gold Lab Foundation uh, website as something that we absolutely must read. And so he, he recommended that we all read Hunting for Hope, and it was a book that I got and uh, just could not put down. So Scott is today going to be talking about the relationship between environment and health. That last question actually is a superb transition because the gist of what I'm going to say is you cannot have healthy organisms, human, be any organism, on a sick planet. The World Wildlife Fund every four years publishes a World Wildlife Index based on detailed field studies by scientists who look at hundreds of species across the family of life. And between 1970 and 2014, in their surveys, the actual number of organisms, not species, organisms, across that representative sample decreased by 40% in not quite 50 years. 40% of the organisms, every sort, birds, reptiles, amphibians, mammals, disappeared. That's the background of what I'm talking about. We are aware of the protective and restorative power of nature in our own bodies, from our immune system to our microorganisms, microbiome. We are aware of nature as a source of medicines. Here are five pretty well-known examples, aspirin from willow bark, penicillin from bread mold, medicines for treating leukemia and Hodgkin's disease from rosy periwinkle. ACE inhibitors for treating hypertension come from the venom of pit vipers. And medicine, antiviral drugs for treating HIV AIDS come from a marine sponge. And if that is not a potent argument for protecting all forms of biodiversity on the planet, I don't know what argument would be more powerful. But beyond the gift of medicines, well, one more example. Just last year in the journal, Nature. Scientists reported the discovery of a promising new broad spectrum antibiotic derived from a common bacterium in soil. But beyond the gift of medicine, beyond the genius of healing that we come into the world with, what are the health benefits that we derive from nature in a more general sense, the sense implied in this aphorism attributed to Hippocrates that nature itself is the best medicine? In recent decades, researchers have conducted hundreds of studies documenting the beneficial effects of nature contact across a whole array of physiological and psychological measures on blood pressure and heart rate, on levels of blood sugar and stress hormones, on the functioning of our immune system and our parasympathetic nervous system, on conditions such as anxiety and hyperactivity and dementia, and on mental stamina and mental focus. I have a handout, a few paper copies, but it will also be posted with this talk on the, web, the Gold Lab website, of 75 references to that body of research. It's a huge body of research. All I'm going to show you here 
in three short slides, are conclusions from three meta-analyses, that is, analyses that looked at a whole array of underlying studies and drew conclusions about their findings. The first one found that the, the effects of nature on mental and physical health have been rigorously demonstrated. The balance of evidence indicates conclusively that knowing and experiencing nature makes us generally happier, healthier people. Now, my granddaughter, our oldest granddaughter, who's 13, would hear that and say, well, duh. We all know that we like nature, that we're drawn to it and so forth, but the fact is that people will not spend money to protect nature. People will not spend money to bring nature into work environments, hospitals, unless they have data that show, in fact, it has a beneficial effect. Another review study, again, looking at hundreds of underlying studies published in 2014, concluded those who are more connected to nature tended to experience more positive affect, vitality, and life satisfaction. And just one other example of a review study, also from 2014, fundamental conclusion, a harmonizing effect of nature, especially on physiological stress reactions, was found across all body systems. And stressors, stress reactions, is just shorthand for anything that compromises any system in our bodies or in the larger ecosystem. One of the most influential studies in this field was published in 1984 by Roger Ulrich in the journal Science. It was based on the records of patients recovering from bladder surgery in a hospital in Pennsylvania. Patients in rooms on one side of the ward had windows that looked out on a brick wall. Patients who had windows on the other side of the ward had windows that looked out on a grove of trees. They didn't go to the trees, they just see the, saw them through the window. And what Ulrich found was the people with a view of trees required less pain medication, registered fewer complaints with the nursing staff, suffered fewer post-operative complications, and were released earlier from the hospital than the people who could look out their window at a brick wall. Now those findings, plus dozens of follow-up studies looking at other patient records, have persuaded many hospitals to green their facilities when they renovate old facilities or when they construct new facilities. You can see, maybe not, the details don't show up here, but in addition to large windows admitting lots of daylight, this individual patient room, and it's a hospital in Nashua, New Hampshire, has floral patterns in the upholstery on the pillowcase. It's got a vase of flowers on a table, bedside table. It has a dried arrangement on a desk. Also treatment rooms in many hospitals. This is Massachusetts General Hospital. That is an intensive care ward. Anybody who's ever worked in one or even seen an image of one on a television knows that they tend to be very cluttered, very closed, windowless, kind of frantic setting. This is serene. You almost would like to have an emergency so you could just <laughs> spend some time in there. Well, grounds, gardens, of course, have long been associated with hospitals or places treating people's ailments going clear back to the Middle Ages. This is Prouty Garden at uh, Boston's Children's Hospital. It was always assumed that these gardens simply were good for the patients, either to look at them or perhaps those who are ambulatory to spend time outside in them. And that, that certainly is. It tends to accelerate recovery. But it's also good for families and friends who visit people who are hospitalized. And it's good for hospital staffs. So many hospitals have added gardens and parks that didn't formerly have them. 
This is a garden designed for people suffering from dementia. And one of the characteristics of such gardens is a rich array of sensory stimulation. So lots of textures, lots of colors, lots of fragrances. And it has the effect, the measurable effect, of reducing anxiety, lowering the use of medications, improving concentration and attention on the part of the patients or the part of the people there, and also improving their appetite. Gardens designed especially for children tend to be built on a, be, be landscape on a smaller scale with lots of nooks and crannies. And again, children who are recovering from surgery or coping with cancer therapies, chemo and radiation, benefit in measurable ways by having access to such a garden, as do the children who are at the hospital visiting a family member or a friend who's been hospitalized. Schools are also being greened on the basis of research that shows views out the window, daylighting, things as simple as that, views of nature out the window and daylighting, so things as simple as that reduce absenteeism, improve concentration, and enhance learning rates in measurable ways. One study of schools, a range of schools, that when they were either renovated or construct or designed and constructed, that additional daylight in classrooms and the view out the window of growing things, as opposed to just streets and buildings and even playground equipment, that those schools achieve, on average, a 20 to 25 percent learning rate increase in their classrooms. Gardens at schools give children the opportunity of working cooperative, cooperatively, not just with paper or things on screens, as they do in classrooms, that's important, but not just that, but with actual organisms, growing plants. The Centers for Disease Control estimates that school-aged children in the United States spend on average four and a half hours a day watching television. And they do most of those four and a half hours sitting still, and some of them, for many of those kids, eating junk food. And that combination has contributed to an epidemic rise in obesity rates among school-aged children. And it's also contributed to a widespread, widespread symptoms of vitamin D deficiency. Well, one of the advantages of a garden at a school, simple antidote to obesity, is physical activity. It also, incidentally, gets kids in the presence of sunlight, which will foster the production of vitamin D in their bodies. The Kaiser Family Foundation estimates that American school children, on average, spend seven and a half hours a day looking at all kinds of screens, not just televisions, but laptops, phones, video consoles. And we all know that there are marvelous things that come through those devices. And most of us have an electronic devices in our pockets or purses or backpacks right now. But seven and a half hours a day looking at screens, almost all of it indoors because screens are hard to see outdoors, also contributes to vitamin D deficiency and to sedentism. Kids don't walk around looking at a laptop. They don't walk around looking at a video console. So once again, school gardens offer children an opportunity to interact in a world, not in a virtual way, but in a tangible way. The root, word, the root of the word tangible means to touch, that which we can actually handle, smell, taste, feel on our skin. The difference, I'll go back, the difference between the expressions on the, these children's faces, mesmerized as they may be, enriched as they may be by this experience, and the expressions on these girls' faces tells us a lot about 
what psychologists call attention recovery, the kind of study that's required in school fatigues the brain. It's a very particular kind of concentration, focused concentration. Outdoors, our attention is much more generalized, even when we're examining a particular thing, because our senses are taking in information from all over. And believe it or not, that actually relaxes. That, that's a metaphor, but it, it provides recovery from fatigue for the brain. The National Association of Science Teachers, looking at the results in math and science scores of schools that added gardens to their schoolyard, didn't change anything else, saw an improvement in math and science scores on the order of 20%. No other changes. Same teachers, same facilities, all they added was gardens, and incorporated gardens into their teaching. Gardens also have the effect of helping to change many children's attitudes towards fruits and vegetables. And they've had, it's had measurable effects on improving nutrition in children with all of the physiological benefits that follow from that. Many schools enable, allow children to harvest the food that's grown on the grounds if they have a vegetable garden to make salads from them, in some cases to do simple kinds of cooking like, like stir fry or soups. It's a lot harder to document the benefit of beauty and direct connection with wildlife that gardens of all sorts, but especially school gardens, because for many kids that's the only garden they're going to encounter. It's harder to document the benefits of that, but surely joy is good for us. As you can see, I think, on the face of this girl. And curiosity is good for us. I mean, this boy might end up as a molecular biologist. But uh, he may be looking at a bird. He may be looking at a butterfly or just looking for something. But to have children outside and have the opportunity to act on their natural curiosity is good for them. It's, again, it's hard to quantify that but I'm convinced it's true. Well, owners and managers of workplaces have come to recognize, many of them, the business advantages of greening their workspaces. Moving a workforce from the cubicles that you see on the left of the slide to something maybe not quite as luxurious as this meeting room, but one that is open to the outside, with day, brings in daylight, bring some nature into the room itself. There's a cactus in a bowl here on the table. There might be, there might be potted plants and so forth. As you'll see in the next, so next slide at this, again, pretty luxurious workstation. My office at Indiana University never looked remotely like that. <laughs> Although I had an array of windows looking out on the woods, and I always had, I always had plants. Uh, growing in my yard, my wife would let me take the ones that were the hardest to kill by neglect. <laughs> and the greening a workplace, as in schools, reduces absenteeism. It reduces health complaints and therefore health costs. It improves productivity. These are all measurable and are me have been measured in studies. And it enhances recruitment. Uh, recruitment and retention of employees. And that's all money in the bank for a business. So greening a workplace, while it may cost money, will more than repay for itself in dollars and cents. <laughs> we evolved outdoors. And until about a century ago, almost all human beings spent almost all of their waking hours under the sun. And we, our, our biorhythms are registered or, or developed in harmony with the changing not only location, but intensity and quality of light over the course of the day, which is why atriums, whether this happens to be in a corporate headquarters in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but atriums in a university, in a mall, in a school, in a business, 
by emitting daylight and daylight that changes its quality and moves around, the, the, the lighted places move around over the course of the day, speak to something very deep in our bodies. Again, I don't have the science, I don't know if anybody has the science or has tried the science to, make, to, to articulate that connection, but I'm convinced of it. And anyone who spends time in a workplace or any study place that has access to an atrium will say that it's one of the most pleasant appealing uh, portions of that structure. Cities have long recognized the importance of green space. But as cities become larger and sprawl, and sprawl farther and buildings become higher and there's more and more pavement, the green spaces become more precious. When the construction of a central park was proposed for New York City in the 19th century, there were critics who said, we shouldn't do that, it's a waste of money, it's a waste of space. But fortunately, the city fathers and mothers ignored the criticism, hired Frederick Law Olmsted and others to design it and construct it, and it ever since has had been a treasure of that city for the people who live there and for those who visit. And it's a treasure in part because it offers an alternative to what the rest of the city is. The rest of the city is crowded. In the case of New York, it's got skyscrapers, it's noisy, it's dirty, and it has very little that's alive other than people and Norway rats. The park is, offers an opening to the sky, day and night. Clouds, weather, rain, stars. It offers lawns like this one, but it also offers water features, trees, and places for people to gather in an informal, soci uh, uh, easy soci sociability, conviviality. There's no more open space in New York City, but recently in 2011, in fact, the city opened what's called the High Line Park, which you're looking at there, which was constructed on a disused rail spur, almost, a, almost not quite one and a half mile long rail spur, which they planted to grasses and wildflowers, which immediately attracted butterflies, birds, other insects, and people. And it's a, I've not had a chance to go there yet. I'm eager to do so. Maybe some people in the room have had a chance to visit it. As at schools and at hospitals, green spaces in cities invite and offer the space for exercise and exposure to sun and now all that good acquisition development of vitamin D, but also a, a places where people can come together in a non-competitive way to occupy the same space. They're not jostling for space on a sidewalk. They're not jostling for customers in stores. They're simply together doing something, in this case, a yoga class, I'm guessing, doing something together in a peaceful and mutually pleasant way. Even a small pocket park like this one offers a refuge from the noise and the hustle of the city. And within five minutes of sitting down in, walk, strolling around in, or lying down on the grass in such a place, within five minutes, your blood pressure goes down, the level of stress hormones in your blood go down. It's all measurable. And all of that is good for our health. And it's one of the reasons why people are drawn to these spaces. You feel better after having been in them. Just a couple other bits of print. I'm not going to inflict too much more of them on you. But this was an article published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2013. And the takeaway is it's, it's written in the kind of language, I guess, that scientists have to use in order to impress other scientists. The gist of it is we need, biologically, contact with dirt and plants in order for our immune system to know what planet we live on. It, 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 it regulates our immune system to come in contact with the microbes that we have co-evolved with. Or if you put it the other way, isolation from dirt and plants messes up 
or compromises our immune system. So one of the advantages, simple advantages of the green space is immunoregulation. So green spaces are hard to put in cities that are already built. Chicago, under the younger Mayor Daley, started a really aggressive program to put gardens on rooftops, including all public buildings in the city. And a lot of businesses have done the same in apartment buildings. This is a rooftop garden in Chicago. In my hometown of Bloomington, Indiana, where Tom Blumenthal was the chair of the biology department till Colorado stole him away from us. <laughs> Somebody cheered that, Larry cheered that. <laughs> Not against Indiana, but he's for Colorado, that's okay. Well, there was a parking lot downtown, a little nondescript parking lot, which was turned into this beautiful little garden, which is between a children's science museum called Wonder Lab and a bicycle path. And it is tremendously popular, as you can imagine. But whenever you can turn a parking lot into a garden, wherever that happens, the world has, microscopically at least, a better place. Now, Boulder also has parks. And I'm told that this is a typical view <laughs> in, a, in a Boulder park. I can't, I can't testify to that because I haven't had the time to get out and look, but I'm told that's a typical, typical site. This, I'm also told, and I, I think it's more plausible, that these are folks tubing on Boulder Creek, which I would love to do when I get the chance. Boulder has a reputation, as people here know, I'm sure, of being America's thinnest city. Since every third shop in the neighborhood of the Marriott is devoted to fitness. <laughs> and every other shop is devoted to clothing for people who are fit. <laughs> and then the remaining third is devoted to natural foods for people who are fit. It's easy to believe. And also just actually looking around at the streets. This, and insofar as it is true, it's because the city is blessed with trails, and natural destinations near or in the city that are beautiful, including the Red Rocks in Settlers Park, just out on the edge of Boulder. Across the US, many, many homeowners are naturalizing their yards. They're basically replacing grass with a greater diversity of vegetation. It shades the house, it filters water, it cleans the air, and it gives a more interesting array of textures for people to look at. It also offers beauty for people who live in these houses and for passers-by, and it provides habitat for wildlife, for butterflies and birds and pollinating insects, including those honeybees. One more bit of print. What if, let me go back to that instead. I want you to listen to this and not just read that slide, okay? So what if you don't have a yard? What if the streets you live on is devoid of trees? What if you live far away from any park or garden or riverfront and, and you're poor and you don't have access to those places and you don't have the money to go to a state park or a national park? What then? You're going to miss out on all these benefits we know about. We know about that, pro studies show that proximity to green space boosts the, the immune system. We know that proximity to green space lowers the risk of low birth weight babies and therefore the risk of lifetime physiological and perhaps mental impairment and of infant mortality. We know that the denser the tree covery, the tree canopy covery in a neighborhood, the lower the risk of asthma for children. And we know that trees 
reduce the heat island effect in cities and therefore the associated heat-related ailments such as dehydration and, and strokes. So there was a very influential article published in The Lancet in Britain in, in, uh, in 2008 that took seriously those questions. And it said, if you want to improve the health prospects for poor people, and, and the society is not willing to pay the money to provide an adequate health care for those people, and we live in a society where there is enormous resistance to that, alas, what the authors argue is you can improve the natural environment in poor neighborhoods and contribute a good deal to an improvement in their health prospects. It's a simple idea, and it turns out to be a lot cheaper than most of the expansion of health care services models. So it's not in competition with that, it complements that. So a number of cities have taken this seriously. In Philadelphia, there is a, a partnership with counties in surrounding adjacent states to plant a million trees over the next five years that will increase the, the tree coverage, the tree canopy, especially in poor neighborhoods in, the city, in, in Philadelphia, by 30%. There's a vigorous tree planting program in Detroit, a very hard hit city, a tree planting program that has a partnership between residents in these hard hit neighborhoods, local, state, and federal agencies, and also lots of nonprofits that are specifically devoted to this work. One of those nonprofits has led the effort to reclaim vacant lots in the city of Detroit. In one year recently, it was about two years ago, within a year, almost 1,400 of those vacant lots, vacant because houses that were abandoned and boarded up were demolished. They had become infested with rats or drug dealers or other abusive presences, dangerous presences. Nearly 1,400 of those vacant lots were turned into gardens and little parks. In downtown Detroit, the Urban Farming Initiative, Urban Michigan Farming Initiative, turned an entire city block into an urban farm in what had previously been a food desert. There are urban farms, small and large, spreading in cities across America. This is in Chicago, within sight of what I still think of as the Sears Tower. That was what it was when my son worked there. I don't remember who owns it now. This is in Milwaukee. The man in the center is named Will Allen, who about 20 years ago started an organization called Growing Power Milwaukee. He's a retired NBA player who saved his money, and he and his wife bought derelict abandoned property in downtown Milwaukee, where he grew up, and turned it, the first one into an urban farm. There are now over a dozen of these urban farms spread around Milwaukee, and they, they have been modeled, uh, models following them are now in Chicago and in Detroit and other cities. They include greenhouses, such as what, the one we're looking at. They include fish tanks for growing protein and, and purifying water. The water that they return to the, to the Milwaukee uh, water system is cleaner than the water they take out of it. They have composting operations, they have produce markets, and so on. There's a garden in, on White House grounds, as you may know, thanks to Michelle Obama, who, of course, has been abused for doing such a left-wing thing as having a garden in the <laughs> grounds of the White House, shown here with fifth graders from an elementary school in Washington, D.C. Recently, and this was the first year. And recently, those kids who are now in high school had a reunion for this year's planting of the garden. Last year, the Obama administration, also uh, having then receiving criticism for their left-wing gesture, launched a program called Kids in Every Park, or every, no, I'm sorry, Every Kid in a Park, 
kids in every park would be good too, but every, every kid in a park which offers free admission to fourth graders and their families to all national parks and to a number of other federal lands and also offers transport support to schools that need it. The produce from these urban farms and community gardens and growers living near cities is sold in farmers markets coast to coast. And I know many of you patronize such markets. The Department of Agriculture estimates that 20 years ago there were about 1,500 of them, 1,500 20 years ago. There are now almost 9,000. This is a growing phenomenon for a number of reasons. More and more people recognize the, 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 the greater uh, preferential taste of fresh produce, but also the greater nutritional value. They also recognize that it's beautiful, that this unpackaged, unprocessed food, as it comes out of gardens, is beautiful. These markets connect us more closely to the soil that ultimately feeds along with marine sources, feeds human beings planet-wide. These few inches of soil, and maybe in a few, in some places like Iowa and northern Indiana, a few feet of soil. But all of our food comes out of that thin stratum. Farmers markets are also convivial places. They encourage social interactions. They bring together people of all ages, of all ethnicities, and of all social and economic classes. One of the criticisms, criticisms made about farmers markets, oh, it's, well for, it's for rich people. It's not true. The prices of fresh fruits and vegetables in season in farmers markets are typically cheaper than in the grocery store. It is, it is way cheaper than Whole Foods. <laughs> uh, so this is actually a way, and, and some of the most, most successful farmers markets in America are in poor neighborhoods, where people are having access to fresh, fresh produce who otherwise would never have that access. I'm going to just speed through a, a short sequence now about a discipline in which nature is used by people who are trained professionally to prescribe particular nature encounters or activities for particular conditions. For people with mobility impairment, this girl's at the garden of the Shriners Hospital for Children in Chicago. This young man is exuberantly harvesting lettuce in a therapy program at the coastal Maine Botanical Gardens. This woman is part of a therapy program that involves daily gardening, which has been shown, according to a report from the University of Washington, to significantly reduce the risk of dementia. And those who have dementia are receiving palliative care through horticultural therapy that reduces levels of anxiety, lowers the uses of medicine, improves concentration and attention and appetite. Horticultural therapy is being used in prisons. This one is in Florida. It's a hydroponics facility. And in prisons, this interaction with nature has been shown to reduce aggression, to reduce discipline problems, to enhance job skills and work ethic, and to dramatically re reduce recidivism rates. It's being used at the Cook County Jail in Chicago. It's being used at Rikers Island, which is the main jail for the city of New York. In Washington State, inmates are trained to breed and nurture endangered species, included, including the Oregon spotted frog. They're also learning to train service dogs to work with disabled veterans. And all of these programs, as you might imagine, give the inmates a greater sense of self-worth and of social usefulness, which is one of the major factors that has reduced the recidivism rate. 
they can re-enter society feeling they have a right to be out there among us. I'm closing with a few brief thoughts about why nature contributes to our well-being. And I'm going to read these because I've tried to word them carefully, and they're fairly brief. We have created a stress-filled way of life, and nature offers a respite from the crowds, schedules, noise, haste, and information overload. It also offers us earthy smells, sunlight on our skin, the feel of wind on our faces. During more than 90% of our evolutionary history, humans were hunter-gatherers. Nature was our home. Most indigenous languages don't even have a word for nature. It was simply the world. Our rituals and lore and stories are filled with animals, plants, mountains, rivers, and stars. Our senses are primed to respond to the natural world. We take it in with every breath, every bite we eat, every drop we drink. We co-evolved with other species, including microbes in the dirt on this child's hands. Among those microbes is Mycobacterium vacae, common in soil, which triggers release of serotonin, a neurotransmitter that lifts our mood and speeds up our brains. As one who has always loved to dig in the dirt, I was delighted to learn of this helpful microbe. We like nature. It fascinates us amuses us, intrigues, and entertains us. The distinguished biologist and entomologist who's already been mentioned, Edward O. Wilson, has called this innate affection for living things biophilia. We share a kinship with all other living things. In fact, our bodies are ecosystems containing thousands of mutually dependent species. Technology enables us to forget these truths in closing us in artificial structures, such as this wonderful and useful one that we're in at this moment, giving us the illusion that we are separate from the rest of nature. This separation contributes to many of our ailments, from vitamin D deficiency and attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, to allergies and depression, anxiety disorder, and stress-related cardiovascular damage. One of my fondest hopes for children, such as my granddaughter Elizabeth here in the mulberry tree, is that they will recognize nature as our original home, the source and sustainer of all life. Our society runs at ever accelerating speeds dictated by machines and electronics. Our bodies, however, run on biological rhythms and earth rhythms, and contact with nature allows us to slow down and restore those patterns. Because of our evolutionary inheritance, there is a deep resonance between our brains and natural patterns. Much of what we find beautiful including human art and mathematics and the formulas of science, can be traced back to nature. The word health has the same root as the words whole, that's W-H-O-L-E, whole, and holy. To be healthy is to be in a state of wholeness, a harmony of body, mind, and relationships. Nature will remain a healing power for us only so long as nature itself is not degraded, not poisoned, not disrupted by our actions. If we care about human health, we must also care about the health of Earth, its soils, waters, and atmosphere, and all its living creatures. Thank you.
there's time for a few questions. Mm -hmm. I don't see it. Okay, good. Mark, Mark Twain once said, the most dangerous place for a man to stand is between an audience and lunch. <laughs> so, sing on. Okay. As a native New Yorker, I've got to correct you on one thing. You speak of our Norway rats. Now, as a tourist, you may count them in your subways. But as a New Yorker, I've got to tell you, we have far more contact with cockroaches. <laughs> Other questions over here? Why don't you start with this one since he's close. And... So that was a wonderful talk. So my question is, you know, uh, when you go in hospitals, right, we all know the smell that first comes is so aseptic and formalin and all that. It's so filled and it actually depresses you there. And it's very, very hard for the existing facilities to have the scenery in each of the you know, hospital rooms with the big windows and all that. So why not just changing that smell with some kind of a lavender or some, you know, <laughs> No, you know, in, 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 uh, in airports, Cinnabon, <laughs> they, this is true, they have an aerosol that they release into the ventilation system in the airport. So no matter where you are, if there's a Cinnabon franchise, you're going to smell Cinnabon. Uh, yes, our olfactory uh, senses are among our most ancient, and they bypass all sorts of cognitive filtering that sight and sound and so forth go through. And so smell can have a very, very profound effect on us, and it's an interesting suggestion. It might be that the smell of lavender or lilac or, or dirt, uh, for those who like the smell of dirt, as I do, uh, might in fact be uh, a calming have the calming effect. I mean, think about it. It is so striking. I didn't mention this, but you can look at a picture of nature on a screen, and it has some effect, not as much as if you were outside in it, and not quite as much as you would have just looking at a window, through a window at nature, but you can look at a picture of nature on a screen, and it lowers your level of stress. It's a real physiological reaction. And so anything that could be done, even within hospitals that can't afford to you know, tear down a wing and build, rebuild it, but it might have to do with what's on the walls. It might have to do with, with instead of entirely white starch sheets, maybe something that had a floral pattern in it. I'm just making those, throwing out those suggestions. Try it, and then ask patients how they felt about it. I have a very similar question to what you just said, really. And Scott, that was lovely. It was Thank really you. inspiring. But so much of what you talked about was smaller than trying to preserve wild nature. Yeah. Okay. Pocket parks. Yeah. And and gardening and uh, floral prints on the in the in the hospital rooms. Yeah. And uh, I was reminded by our New Yorker friend that not all contact with nature reduces stress. Okay. I don't really like snakes. Yeah. I'm not that big on cockroaches. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about what the characteristics of, of the, the things that are helpful versus the ones that are perhaps more, or, you know, how, how, can we, yeah. how can we do this in a way that's going to support a planet of, you know, 10 billion people, mostly in urban areas? How, 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 do, we, how do we do this? Excellent, enormous question. And this, and this is the last one. So, so you know when I stop speaking, you can go eat. <laughs> um, and, I, and I can't give an adequate answer within the space, reasonable space. First of all, nature includes tornadoes, hurricanes, cancer. I mean, I, I know all that stuff. And, and if you're sitting there in the audience saying, well, he's only talking about nice nature. Not, not, cockroaches tend not to kill us. They can spread disease. But tornadoes kill us. Earthquakes kill us. Landslides kill us. And, so, and ultimately, nature's going to get us back, right? <laughs> so, so we have amazing systems in our bodies, and as do other organisms, to sustain us over time, but not indefinitely. That's why we have doctors, right, and medicines and so on, and that's why ultimately we die. So nature, of course, there's a sense in which nature is everything. I spend most of my life as a writer and public speaker talking about climate disruption, biodiversity extinction, and all those big scale 
changes that humans are imposing on our planet, and not just on our species, but all the other millions of species. So I know and think about those things all the time. In some ways, my, my career has been an effort to figure out how many different ways I can talk to different audiences about why we ought to take care of the Earth. Right? It's so patently obvious to me that we ought to take care of our home planet that it, you know, uh, uh, it's difficult for me to put myself in the mindset of somebody who says, why do we need an Endangered Species Act? Why do we need an Environmental Protection Agency, for Lord's sake? It cuts into profits. I can't get in that mind. That's, that, that mind has a kind of blindness about where we are and what we're made of. So talking about how the greening of schools, simple things that most schools can afford to do, like a garden in their schoolyard. Um, like greening, and uh, granted, it's not the kinds of luxurious rooms we saw in the hospitals here. Not every hospital can do that. I understand that. But anything we can do that will increase human contact with the rest of the natural world, and it really is the rest of the natural world because we're part of nature, anything that we can do will enhance our well-being. And I'm convinced that the more contact we have, with other living things, the more responsible we're going to be as citizens, as consumers, terrible word. We should think of ourselves as conservers rather than consumers. The more contact we have with other living beings, the more likely it is that we will behave in ways, collectively and individually, to take care of our home planet. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.